Thanks for the, for the welcome. Uh, so I'm Ankur. I'm a, I'm a graduate student at the AMP, at the AMP Lab uh, and a Spark committer and uh, the maintainer for Graphex. Um, so I'll be talking about uh, this problem of supporting efficient fine-grained updates to RDDs. And the original motivation for this work was actually Graphex, where we wanted to add, in, to add uh, these uh, the vertices and edges to an existing graph um, while maintaining some index structures. But we think this is actually also broadly useful um, and, uh, and brings together some interesting research ideas as well. So here's the motivation. So Spark allows users to build data sets, uh, which are these parallel collections of records, and it lets users manipulate the, the, the data sets using data parallel operators, like, uh, operators like MapReduce uh, or SQL-like operators. Now, uh, Spark executes these, these, uh, these transformations by breaking them up into tasks that run concurrently on the cluster. And each task executes independently on its input records and produces separate outputs. Now, Spark is, of course, intended to scale to large clusters where hardware failures or software bugs can happen in the, in the middle of a query. So one of the key points of, of Spark is its mid-query fault tolerance, where uh, it recovers from failures by rerunning just the failed tasks without having to restart the whole query as a traditional database might do. So that avoids wasting resources on rerunning large queries. Uh, and also, some, some machines might have these transient slowdowns for multi-tenancy or garbage collection pauses. And uh, so straggler mitigation can optionally launch uh, these speculative uh, duplicate, co duplicate copies of slow tasks and use the output of the task that finishes first. So here, for example, uh, map task two is slow, and then uh, Spark, after some timeout, will speculatively launch a duplicate copy of it. Um, now, both these features, fault tolerance and struggle mitigation, require that each time a task is run, it leads to the same result, regardless of what else has occurred in the system. So that's this property of task replayability. Uh, and Spark ensures this by requiring each task's input to be uh, immutable, uh, which is implemented by copying the input effectively before updating it. Uh, and also, tasks have to be uh, deterministic. So that's partially guaranteed by making them single-threaded, although it's still possible to, to bring in some non-determinism if, uh, if you try. Um, but uh, so the, these two properties of, of the, well, the, the key property is this immutability, which ensures replayability. So immutability is, is, is the best way to ensure that Spark tasks are replayable, which is important for the system. But people are starting to use the Spark for a widening range of applications. A simple example is, uh, is streaming aggregation, where we have some series of events, like one Twitter user following another, and we want to maintain some aggregate for each, uh, for each category, something like a follower count. Uh, another example is incremental algorithms, where we have some stream of updates, something like a new vertices and edges in a graph, and we want to maintain uh, the whole graph and also do some incremental computation each time the graph changes. So Spark is a, it's a compelling platform for these applications because they often fit into a larger pipeline where the other operations are these bulk transformations like loading data or performing ad hoc queries or machine learning. But these applications don't fit into that, that same bulk transformation model because they require efficient fine-grained updates. So there are some obvious solutions, uh, but they each have significant problems. So maybe the most obvious solution that you might think of and might even have tried is just to, modify, to, to apply updates by modifying data directly in memory or on disk. Um, now, this is fast, but it comes at the cost of fault tolerance, because uh, task failures will just trivially corrupt the, the data by leaving different keys in different states. So here's an example where uh, there's this task, the, the function on the top, that uh, increments x and y. This is a toy example. Uh, and then if it runs, uh, runs partially and then fails, uh, then it, it, in this case, it might, could manage to increment x but not y. And then uh, that leaves this mutable state on the bottom uh, inconsistent, even after retries. So a better option is, is to move, uh, move some data from, uh, from RDDs into a transactional database that supports uh, uh, atomic batch writes. That, after all, is, is what those systems are designed for. Uh, and in fact, Trident, which is a storm streaming system, does this directly. And other systems, there's a, new, a research system called NIAD uh, that also do this in an in a, uh, indirect manner by, um, by using logging and checkpointing. But a common pattern in Spark is performing different computations on the same base data. So uh, here's an example where we, we extract both the top ads uh, from some click data set as well as um, the most popular pages. So uh, here the problem is that uh, in order to, to support this, we would need to, to actually take a snapshot of, of the space data um, while it's being modified and then keep that snapshot open until, uh, until the, the next modification is done. So it sort of re requires this global view of a program, which systems don't typically have. And also, moreover, it's, it's inefficient to, to, to support these long-lived snapshots in traditional databases. So for example, Postgres can do multi-version concurrency co control, which supports this, but it's, uh, it's not efficient. 
And, and so this just sort of depicts that problem where the, the same, where two different tasks can access the same base data set uh, at different times, and that, require, that, that sort of requires immutability from a logical standpoint. Uh, one other thing is that, is that uh, in the presence of mutability, which is, which is in this case in databases, uh, that really complicates parallel recovery, whereas uh, Spark and Spark Streaming can, can do recovery in parallel very efficiently just because of the data, data immutability. Um, so what Spark currently does is just the simple solution of copying the entire RDD before updating it. And that makes sense when, uh, in the common case, maybe when most or all the records are being changed for every transformation, but for sparse updates, uh, of course, it's very inefficient. So there seems to be this trade-off between immutability for fault tolerance and strive mitigation on the one hand, as well as some other uh, things, debuggability, reusability, parallel recovery, uh, and then on the other hand, supporting these fine-grained updates uh, for, for these, these kinds of new algorithms. So, uh, so the question of, of, our, of this work is, is whether it's possible to get both. Um, and it turns out, yes, it is. There's actually a kind of data structure, a class of data structures that supports both of these properties, both immutability and efficient updates. Now, these are called persistent data structures, and this is made out of the concept of persistence from the programming languages community. So it's not, it's not stable storage, that's the kind of OS um, idea of persistence. Instead, it means that past versions stay around even after uh, they're updated, so sort of like Git. Um, so persistent data structures, to summarize, they support efficient version updates that create a new version rather than modifying the exi existing version. And updates return a new copy that internally shares almost all of the structure of the existing copy. Now that's easiest to do uh, as depicted uh, below when the data is organized in a tree, uh, because then updates only need to sort of allocate a small fraction of, the no of new nodes and then leave the rest uh, the same. So what, uh, uh, so what I'll talk about uh, here is that we created this new persistent index data structure called, called PART, that's what we call it, um, and, uh, and then use that to implement a new kind of RDD called index RDD. And in, uh, Index RDD stores key value data, and in addition to supporting all of the standard uh, pair RDD and RDD operations, it can also be efficiently updated without having to, to do a full copy. And it does this by, uh, by using this part data structure, which I'll describe in a few slides. So uh, it also uses part to, to, support, uh, these, to support point lookups and pre-indexed joins. Um, and all, it, it does all of this pretty efficiently and in very little code. So you can see the line of code, uh, lines of code counts there. Uh, so here's how it works. Um, at, at a high level, RDDs normally store their contents in an array for each partition uh, when they're cached. Um, and index RDD just instead uses this special part data structure. Uh, and everything else remains the same. So keys are still partitioned using the standard uh, hash or range partitioning. Updates are stored in the lineage, which acts as sort of a write ahead log for fault tolerance. Uh, and then updates return a new, a new index RDD that reflects the updates. So uh, this, this, this approach builds completely on top of Spark. So it interop interoperates with, uh, with other batch computations. And now here's what the interface looks like. So first, note that, um, that uh, just from the signature there, you can see that uh, index RDD supports uh, all of the same operations as a pair RDD, a pair of uh, RDD of key value pair, um, is for any key, val key and value type. Uh, the only restriction is that the key type has to be serializable, and we'll see how, uh, how the part data structure uh, uses this for indexing. Now, uh, part supports, um, as I mentioned, uh, so, so sort of point lookups, get and multi-get, um, and does this just by running a task on the appropriate partitions and then fetching the results from this, uh, this data structure on each partition. Uh, it, it also supports these point uh, updates and deletions, so put, multi-put, delete, um, by modifying the appropriate uh, data structures at each partition and then returning a new RDD. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, and uh, these, uh, these, the, these operations work just like any other RDD operations in that they can only be called from the master. Um, and so if you want, if you want to, do, to do updates from one slave to the other, that's a little trickier. You have to sort of redirect the, the updates through the master. Uh, okay, but, but, but also um, this thing supports, uh, it, it uh, accelerates existing RDD operations. Um, so things like filter, those can also be made faster using this, uh, this index structure. Um, and also there's a bunch of, uh, uh, different join types which, uh, which take advantage of the indexing. So in Spark, by default currently, um, if you do a join, uh, it, it, uh, Spark rehashes all of, all of the uh, input from both sides of the join. Whereas this thing, um, whereas in, it, index RDD can, uh, can exploit the existing indexing uh, to avoid having to do the extra work and just has to do a zip. So um, 
So, so now let's see how, like, what, the, what the magic is. What, how does this, this index, index data structure work? Well, the starting point is some work from databases um, called the adaptive radix tree. And this is a, it's a triad radix tree with a high branching factor and a, a node compression. So, so first of all, the choice of this, high, this 256 area branching factor, um, that simplifies tree operations. It, you just need to address each byte of a key when you're tra traversing down the tree, uh, the try, rather than shifting and masking. Uh, and the second thing is this node compression. Um, so what this means is, is that to reduce space usage, nodes change representations based on their sparsity, their not, number of non-null children. And, and then these node representations are carefully chosen to keep traversal speed high by using things like SIMD instructions for traversal uh, and some other tricks. And then here is a picture of, uh, of a uh, tree, tri or radix tree to sort of refresh your memory. So um, unlike a, a comparison-based, say, binary search tree, um, each node actually branches based on just one, one part of the key, one byte in this case. And so, so here uh, you can see that this, tri this tree is storing uh, like multiple these different words, and then each edge kind of takes takes one um, one byte at the, uh, of the of, of each word at a time, and then does a comparison based on that. And then here's the this is where that work is from. Now uh, you might wonder why why use a radix tree instead of say, say a hash table or a B tree, which is kind of binary search tree. So uh, the answer to that is that well, first there's several answers. One, um, unlike hash tables, radix trees store their keys in sorted order, so that enables range scans. Uh, using this in-order traversal. Um, also, uh, compared to binary search trees or B trees, um, radix trees have these ha have superior as um, asymptotic performance by uh, by taking advantage of the key structure. So uh, each comparison in a, uh, each comparison in a binary search tree only gives you one bit of information. So whether the uh, the, the search key is less or less than you know one side or greater than the other side, um, and uh, uh, and then therefore it reduces the key space only by up to a factor of two. Whereas with the radix tree you can eliminate many more keys at each, uh, at each node. So that means that for, for long keys, uh, for keys of length k, for example, um, the operations in a binary search tree uh, have complexity, this you know, k log n, uh, whereas, uh, whereas operations in a, in a tri or radix tree only have complexity order k. Uh, the th third thing is that radix trees support uh, this uh, very efficient specialized union and intersection operations um, because th they enable these sort of intuitively large numbers of keys to be eliminated based on their prefix structure when doing these operations. And finally, they, they have a, a good performance because they don't require any rehashing or rebalancing. So sort of performance is, is very predictable, especially for insertions, um, compared to a hash table where a rehash might take, uh, might take hundreds of milliseconds uh, or self-balancing by an insert tree. So OK, so, so um, that was the, the base data structure. Now, given that, that, uh, uh, that radix tree data structure, here, here's how, how we get persistence, which was uh, efficient updates and, immutab uh, and Im immutability. So we use this tree structure um, to make sure that a single modification doesn't require a full copy. And instead, when a node is modified, uh, as shown on the, uh, on the bottom there, if we, uh, if we modify the leaf node there, then we just make a copy of that node that, that reflects the update, uh, and, then, uh, and then copy all its ancestors up to the, uh, the root to reflect the pointer change. And, and then, of course, the, the tree height is, is sort of, uh, it's, you know, it's bounded by the key length, uh, and there's also some path, some path compression that, uh, that can reduce it further. Uh, and so it's smaller in practice. So this is not so bad in practice. Uh, so we, we, we uh, wrote this thing in Java, 1,100 lines of Java. Uh, and also, in addition to, to, to this path copying trick, um, each tree node maintains uh, its reference count so that uh, old versions can be removed even while new versions reference part of their data. And I'll, I'll also show uh, more details on that. So here's, here's why we have a reference count. Um, that's to enable this optimization where updates can, can sometimes be performed in place. Uh, in particular, updates to a version that will be immediately discarded um, can be made in place when they wouldn't affect any other versions. So just to, as an example, suppose uh, on the bottom we have an application that has, uh, that has two versions of a dictionary, V1 and V2. Uh, the numbers of the uh, letters are a little small there. But, um, uh, and then suppose in, at time T2, we, we want to apply an update uh, to, to the version v2 forming a new version v3. So now if, um, if v2 is it's subsequently never accessed, and we know that, um, and the update only, apl only applies to the uh, nodes referenced only by v2 and not by v1, then we can actually do this as an, uh, as an in-place mut mutation change of the nodes of VT, v2. So uh, that's what the, the tilde there signifies. It's that logically making a copy in this case is equivalent to doing the update in place. So the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm telling you this is that 
uh, this optimization actually is a pretty, has a pretty big impact, uh, impact for larger batch sizes, where uh, if, you, if you do a, a bunch of updates in succession uh, without, without sort of exposing the intermediate versions, uh, then, you, then at some point they start to almost all take place in place, and so you sort of get the benefits of the performance benefits of mutation while logically retaining the semantics of immutability. So uh, here's the here's the uh, what this what this gives you. So um, the point of this is is, is to show that uh, the performance and efficiency of part are competitive with uh, the, with mutable data structures while providing this extra immutability. Uh, so here we're we're, uh, uh, we're comparing part against this uh, mutable hash table. It's C plus uh, plus STL hash table. Um, and uh, uh, red, red black tree and B tree also in C++. So, um, uh, so, so now the, the colors, the red and, and blue, mean that, uh, mean that part is Im immutable, whereas these other data structures are immutable. So you, you know, sort of already expect um, us to have a disadvantage because every update requires, at the very least, creating a new, a new pointer, a new version to, to get back. But in fact, uh, for larger batch sizes, because of that in-place op um, optimization, we actually can uh, approach and even surpass the performance of a hash table, mutable hash table, I mean. So, uh, so just to go into, into uh, specifics here, uh, for a small batch size of 1,000, uh, we, we still get 120,000 inserts per second single-threaded. Uh, and then as the batch size increases to 10 million, uh, part approaches the performance of uh, this mutable data structure. Uh, okay, so now these are, these are some, some more numbers uh, sort of to show the, uh, the high performance of this data structure. Uh, so these, these don't involve mutation, so the persistence doesn't really come into play, but it shows the benefits of a, a radix tree. So uh, for lookups, for example, uh, you can see that the part is uh, faster than hash tables for, for lookups in, the, in this case, because we actually can terminate early uh, for, for keys that don't exist, and, and that, uh, that avoids a number of uh, cache messes that you'd otherwise get for a hash table. Um, and then uh, uh, now the uh, scan performance and memory usage are comparable to, to the other uh, index data structures. Not as good as B trees in some cases, but, uh, but they're, they're all close. Uh, now, one other thing I wanted to talk about was uh, this, this, this uh, trick that, that we have to speed up checkpointing for finally updated, uh, updated data. So here, um, instead of checkpointing the whole data set, um, we can avoid, well, actually, I should back up and say checkpointing is, a, is important in Spark when you have a, a long lineage chain. Um, because uh, Spark's fault tolerance otherwise would, would kind of try and replay uh, all the way back to the beginning, uh, which, which can result in unbounded recovery times. And so checkpointing lets you bound the recovery time by, by writing the current snapshot of in-memory data to disk. Uh, so um, so uh, normally checkpointing is, is a pretty slow operation because it requires um, writing th this whole data set out to disk, but uh, we actually can, can use this tree structure to tell when, uh, when certain parts of the data haven't been updated since the last checkpoint and then not write those out. Um, so we do this by sort of partitioning the tree into these nodes, into, uh, in, in, by nodes, in order to segregate the, the frequently changed uh, nodes from the infrequently changed ones. And then, uh, then we can sort of track changes in memory uh, for, these, for, for these pages, and then only write, write out the pages that, are, that have been changed since the last time. Uh, and, and in fact, this actually works pretty well for skewed distributions, or skewed write distributions. So uh, the skewed distribution here is in red, uh, and you can see that even if we, if, we, if we do on average one update per, uh, per existing element, we actually still can save, save quite a lot on the, on the checkpointing um, uh, size. So the, the relevant point is the 10 to the zero uh, column there. So there we actually save 80% of, uh, of the space for, for a checkpoint. Now for, for the worst case, close to the worst case, uh, uh, which is this uniform distribution, things are not quite as good. But even then, if, uh, if, you, if we update um, fewer than, say, one in 1,000, elements between checkpoints, then we can get a good savings from this. Uh, now, finally, I, uh, uh, we, uh, we mm, uh, use this to, to, to get some real benchmarks on a, on a full cluster. So uh, here we're, we're counting occurrences of 26-character uh, uh, string IDs in the streaming aggregation kind of setting. And this uses, uh, yeah, so it, it uses synthetic data that generated, generated on these, these eight slaves. Um, and we, we loaded the cluster index RD with uh, a billion keys and then gave it a stream of, of 100 million keys. So now here, uh, it's interesting that, so first there, there's the uh, existing uh, system, so Cassandra, for example, uh, which gets 174,000 keys per second on this cluster. Um, 
uh, Spark Streaming does, does this much worse just because it's not, it's not, it's not well suited for this kind of a, uh, a fine-grained update um, wor workload. And it, instead, it has to rehash all the existing keys uh, in, each, in, in each time step. Uh, on the other hand, Part does, does quite well. So it, it gets uh, 9 million keys per second on this benchmark, um, which is 50 times faster than Cassandra even. And, uh, and then as an upper bound, we, we also had a mutable hash table, which is not fault tolerant and, not, and it's mutable. So there's, there's no guarantees of, uh, 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 of uh, fast checkpointing or, um, uh, or, or access to old versions. And, uh, and this, this actually, you know, we're actually within 18% of uh, this upper bound while providing those benefits. So now, uh, finally, uh, you know, no, no system is perfect, so I, I wanted to, to close with some, uh, some things that, that we're working on. Uh, so one thing is, is this garbage collection pauses. Um, so since we, we wrote this thing in Java, uh, we, you know, uh, the Java garbage collector helps throughput uh, and, and, and hel uh, helps uh, performance by, by changing the mem uh, memory layout to, to suit the access patterns. But uh, these GC pauses do hurt predictability in, in a system where stragglers are, are a problem. So, uh, since we already maintain reference counts, um, our thought is, is to use these for, uh, for garbage collection by putting uh, this uh, parts data off heap and then manually uh, garbage collecting. Uh, also, we, we can use object pools to control fragmentation. That's another benefit. Uh, so we actually did uh, implement this, the part in C++, in C++ as well, and uh, their performance is predictable, as you'd expect. Um, now, the other thing is that uh, scan performance, which is competitive with uh, other index data structures, as you saw, uh, it's still a couple of order, orders of magnitude slower than memory bandwidth uh, for just scanning an array. Uh, so uh, you, so it, it'd be nice to, 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 to have a special allocation strategy that can do better in some cases by, by laying out data uh, in, a, in a good way. Okay, so the takeaway um, is that efficient updates to immutable data isn't a contradiction. And in fact, it's, it's, it's actually possible to have to get pretty good performance while having immutability. Uh, and also, uh, this is a Spark package which you can actually use today. Um, all you have to do is co copy and paste those two lines into your SPT project, and then you can, it, it's a very simple API. Um, and uh, with that, I'm happy to take questions. Will it be integrated with Spark Streaming as a uh, stateful um, uh, stream state? And can I use it now with Spark Streaming? Ah, so the question is about integration with Spark Streaming. Can, can you use it immediately? Uh, so uh, there's, there's, there isn't anything to, to, to let you use it immediately, but I, uh, like anything publicly released. But I, I have a small patch to Spark Streaming that, uh, that will let you do it. So um, uh, I'll, uh, I'll Let's follow up on the on the mailing list or in person, and I'll I'll give you that if you like. And we hope to release it soon. I'll talk to TD about that as well. So I guess you just mentioned something about Spark streaming integration. For now, um, I'm just wondering if this makes sense to you. If you have like you know big initialized like indexed RDD, and then Spark streaming coming in with little you know um, small RDDs coming in in DStream. Um, say you collect those, do a multi-get to find the effective elements, then do a multi, you know, make your updates and then do a multi-put. Is that basically a su suggested thing to do? Yeah, yeah. So I think that approach w would be great. Uh, like the, the thing I was, I was thinking of there was just uh, was making this replace the stateful uh, operations in Spark Streaming in a more seamless way so that you could immediately get that. But yeah, definitely if you're willing to change your code, then you could certainly use IndexRDD from Spark Streaming in that way. Okay. So you talk about compression in the part stru data structure. Mm -hmm. Is that compression horizontal across only a single byte, or do you do vertical compression as well across common subsequences? Right. So, so, so compression actually is kind of a tricky thing. Uh, I was I was talking about uh, talking about node compression there. Uh, so there, there it was like a purely uh, data structure level compression. It it, it, it didn't touch the uh, the the did the uh, like value stored. Um, the point was just to to make sure that nodes which are sparse don't take up the full you know, 256 bytes uh, or 256 pointers. So, um, 
as far as, as far as data compression, um, it's so there's no compression supported because it, it's pretty tricky to, to do, for example, column level compression uh, since you you can't guarantee any 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 layout uh, any ordering of the of the data since anything could could be inserted between two elements, for example. So you know, say run length encoding wouldn't work. Um, so actually, I was asking a little bit different question. So if I have um, a key with say a 24 byte common subsequence for oh. all the stuff, do I traverse 24 nodes? Um, to get down to it, and is there a way to improve that? I see, I see. Yeah, so the, the, the Radix tree does take care of that case, where you have, say, keys with common subsequence, common prefixes, those get compressed out. Um, and then as far as traversing uh, long chains of nodes, uh, we only store as many, as many branches as is necessary to represent the data. So, for example, if all your data starts with the same long prefix, then th that'll get, get compressed away, and you only have one, uh, one hop to traverse that. Okay, great. We can take other questions offline then? Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks.